Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? Today, I'm well, Jason. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Why do I believe that, you know, something has happened to you in the last few days that may be not so good? Well, probably because I had to miss the office Christmas party. I know, we're so looking forward to that. I know. Um, Yeah, I instead got to spend the night in the Perth Children's Hospital because there was a, um, well, let's just say an attempted magic trick went wrong and um, there was a minor surgical procedure required. I think we're going to need some more details than that for the listeners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did Ronan do this time? He, <laughs> um, he was doing some sort of magical trick in, in school and it ended up with a coin getting lodged halfway down his throat. Um, and, and just to be clear, it wasn't a 50 cent piece. Was it was it? a 10 cent piece. Yeah. 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 Um, so just the right size really to get stuck in your throat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't... Um, where it got lodged, it was still above the lungs. So they couldn't just sort of wait for him to get it out the other end. Mm. Um, so they had to put him under a general anesthetic and go in with a with a scope and um, pull the thing out. So, yeah, not a great way to spend a Friday evening, but, um, you know, considering the other ways it could have gone, um, it could have been a lot worse. So, Well, no one had fun at our Christmas function, so you didn't miss out on anything. I, I don't believe you, not even a little bit. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to help. <laughs> Just being disingenuous doesn't help. <laughs> oh, look, I, I try. Well, Ronan's all good though now. Yes, he is. Yes, um, he's been referring it, referring to it as um, his terrifying ordeal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> as you do when you're eight. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, made a firm commitment not to put anything in his mouth that is not edible. Yeah. That's yeah. Smart. For me, for me once. Yes. So at least, uh, yeah, he's, he's learned an important lesson. Um, and uh, yeah, all, all's well that ends well. Great. So um, he will be eating Christmas lunch with you in a couple of weeks. He will be, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. In a week. It's a week <laughs> yeah. away. Oh, wow. That time already. Well, look, um, I'm glad that Ronan's doing well and I'm glad he learned a valuable life lesson about not putting coins down your throat. Mm. Yeah, good. But let's introduce our guest for today, hey? Yes. Yeah. So uh, she, is a, she is a master's degree qualified occupational therapist with a background in occupational rehabilitation, research, policy, and public health. She has worked as both a clinician and manager within the public and private health sectors. She currently serves as director of Workwell at WorkSafe Victoria. Welcome to the podcast, Jennifer Fry. Thank you, Jason. Hi, Joelle. And I guess I need to know what was the magic trick? What was he trying to do? <laughs> well, um, that that was yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure. He said something about that he was trying to make the coin appear in his mouth. Right. So I don't know what the maneuver was <laughs> that happened there. If if he maybe had it hiding under his tongue, or if he was sort of if he like was doing a look over here while I quickly put it in my mouth with this hand. But whatever, whatever happened, um, it ended up going down his throat. So he certainly got it into his mouth. So that aspect of the trick was successful. Successful, right. Yeah, yes. but then and it, it disappeared. Just, it just kept going. What? Well, that was the other thing we, we initially thought, was he trying to make it disappear? In which case, you know, success. <laughs> <It was> successful. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we had a similar situation. When my son was about one, he decided to uh, swallow a $2 coin he was playing with. Probably my fault being a bad dad letting him play with a two dollar coin as a one year old, but um, mm. it went straight through, and we still I think we still have that two dollar coin around somewhere. So. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's gr- it, obviously good to hear that Ronan's doing well. And and Jen, you said it's a beautiful day in Melbourne today. It is. Well, I'm on Ocean in Ocean Grove, which is down on the Victorian coast. So um, I'm on water on country down here. So just acknowledge that uh, I'm on the traditional lands of the people here, and it is very beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. All right. So, Jen, to uh, get us started, can you share with our listeners what some of your favourite podcasts are? Oh, look, um, can I have two? 
Uh, you can have as many it, as you like. Oh, excellent. Well, yeah, well I, just, just letting you know, it is a long format show, but we don't <laughs> want to spend an hour on this. All right. Well, my two, um, one on a personal level is that, and it's probably just my generation, but I am an ABC listener. And um, the ABC Conversation Hour with Richard Feidler is just fantastic. And um, there was one this week that um, was an interview with uh, Charlie King, who's... Uh, He's an absolute national treasure and he's, uh, he's an ABC sports broadcaster um, from Darwin and uh, he's a Gurunji man and he, uh, and he just told this most amazing story of his mum who was a, a stolen generation Gurunji woman who, who was taken from her, her mum at age eight and uh and this story was uh charlie's story of just piecing together that history and uh, was incredibly and I, I guess there's something about storytelling that really resonates i think with most of us but you know i just love hearing people's stories and maybe it's my therapist background as well that you know we just want to hear what makes people tick and uh and that story by by charlie about his mum being stolen and uh and her living in the compound as it was called in Darwin until she was 18 um, and and then you know his and his 10 I think brothers and sisters his life um, and just how uh, how um, much he honored his mum um, but that story and he just talked about us needing to know these stories so, th so that really resonated so that's that's kind of my personal one and I you know I walk along this beautiful beach on Ocean Grove with ear, earbuds in and I just listen to those stories all the time but my work one is um uh it was a, a web a, a podcast series that um that my team was involved in being involved in, in last year with the um Victorian Workplace Mental Wellbeing Collaboration and it was called um uh what was it called it was called leading through change and it was a an in a series of six podcasts with workplace leaders and it was about their reflections on um how do we influence mental health within workplaces from a leadership perspective um and and just a bit their journeys of um of being influencers um, within their own workplaces and, and what motivated them and, and just different leadership styles. So six really, you know, impressive people. Uh, Claire Spencer, who's the CEO of the Arts Centre here in Melbourne, was one of them. Um, uh, from Professor Colleen Haywood from over your, your way, and she really reflected on being a community leader as well as a, a workplace leader and an academic. Um, Damien Wells, who's a, a CEO of a, a water authority, and they all had different perspectives on leadership and uh, and and what actually what the leadership style to to create mentally healthy workplaces. So they were my two. So a strong theme of storytelling in there. Absolutely, and I think that we can learn so much, can't we, from um, just listening to people's experiences of, um, and I, you know, I think when we. Um, lots of workplaces when they're saying how do we create a mentally healthy workplace they want to know what's worked don't they mm, yeah absolutely mm. now can you um, speaking of storytelling can you tell us the story of your professional career look Jason gave a bit of a, a, a thumbnail sketch before so I am an occupational therapist that was my original training and uh, oh, look you know next year my cohort is getting together for our 40th year since we started our training together so oh my god that's a very very long career um, but my career has moved from being a, a clinical occupational therapist I started in rural Victoria in hospitals I moved to occupational rehab um, in the 80s when you know we just had a huge change in our legislation in Victoria our OHS legislation and our workers comp legislation um, and occupational rehabilitation was, um, I mean, we've always had some form of occupational rehabilitation since the war, but this was a really a new way of it being funded and managed and, and very much a developing um, profession um, at that stage. So I worked in the western suburbs of Melbourne. So for anyone from Victoria will know at that stage in the 80s and 90s, we had a very big manufacturing base. Um, and so, so the work was really quite um, 
quite different. You know, I was working in, uh, in textile manufacturing and automotive manufacturing and, uh, um, and in quarries. And, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you know, occupational health and safety was quite different to how it is now. And, uh, um, and so I, I, I saw workplaces and worked within workplaces with injured workers in, um, in environments that, you know, some of them were quite Dickensian, really, in a way. Um, and I guess that's where my, um, my real passion for making workplaces better for people. Um, and, and, you know, as time has gone on, making workplaces mentally better for people uh, has become my passion. I then worked in New South Wales. I worked across three states. I worked um, for the University of Sydney. Uh, for, uh, the Cumberland Health and Research Centre was what it was called. Um, and we had a big occupational health practice there. Uh, and again, you know, doing some really innovative stuff. Um, but then, you know, babies called and uh, an adventure. And my husband was a wildlife vet at the time. So we moved to Alice Springs um, and we had 17 years in the Northern Territory. And, um, and I worked in a whole heap of different places, again, initially in one-to-one -one individual um, occupational rehabilitation or vocational rehab, that we called it then. Um, but I then moved into, I guess, that interest in how can we change systems? Um, how can we work at a population level um, so that we make it better for everybody, not just one by one with our clients or our individuals? So I, I had the great opportunity to work with the Centre for Disease Control up in, in the Northern Territory. So we worked on a number of different sort of population health um, interventions. And when I came back to Victoria, I, um, I sort of continued down that line. I worked with the primary health networks, looking at health system reform. Um, and then four and a bit years ago, um, came to WorkSafe. So a bit back to my roots, I guess, in terms of occupational health um, and have been um, incredibly privileged to, um, to, to work in, this, in the WorkWell program for the last uh, four and a half years. It was a long career. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, quite a, a yeah, uh, a incredible career, mm. and um, yeah, right around Australia. Mm. Haven't made it this far west um, by the sounds no. of it. No, <laughs> only only to visit, but no, haven't worked over in, in on your side at all. Um, although we've got some, you know, we're obviously working with you as a partner, um, and uh, you know, we've got some other contacts over there. So, uh, and I know WA is also. Um, you know, had some chats with us about the Work Well program and uh, and how they can take on some of the the concepts that we've been uh, we've been uh, you know started over here in Victoria. So some good contacts over there, Jason. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to chat with Justine. Hey, mm. find out about that the the WA version of the Work Well program. Absolutely. Maybe they'll do the one upmanship and and an extra five million on compared to what New South Wales did to Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, but Jen, you're you're currently working working as director of the WorkWell program. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, absolutely. So we've, um, we've had five year, a five-year program of work. So funded by WorkSafe in partnership with our Department of Health, and uh, which I think is really, um, really important because it shows that workplace, you know, if we can have healthy workplaces, that has a flow on effect to the rest of the community. So, so you know, so Department of Health are, um, are really interested in, you know, the whole of population health and having good, healthy workplaces contribute to that. Um, so what's our job? Our job is to support employers in Victoria to prevent mental injury and promote a positive and mentally healthy workplace. So we've got big money, we've got $50 million um, of which about 29 million of that is externally focused. Um, so going out to, to different um, bodies, we've got about 530 partners that we're, we're invested with um, that are, they're all working on a huge range of different interventions across every sector. Um, to, to all, but all with the same goal, all about how do we prevent mental injury and how do we promote good mental health and how can workplaces 
you know, be provide people with a net positive for their mental health. Yeah, amazing, and and definitely um, that's why we wanted you on to on, on our podcast because that's obviously the goal for the podcast is to talk about how do we do psychological injury prevention, uh, and given that's uh, you know, and that's what attracted us to being involved in the Work Well program as well. Um, but tell us what, what is this multi pronged approach um, that's incorporated within the program? Yeah, look, I, I guess when the program was first designed, it was very much acknowledged that uh, one size is not going to fit all. Um, and and it was also, you know, one of the other objectives of the program is to build the evidence base. You know, we, we know with uh, workplace mental health, you know, when, particularly four or five years ago, if you looked at the literature, you know, all of the all of the literature was around secondary and tertiary sorts of interventions, uh, you know, EAP sorts of programs supporting people once they they've become distressed. But we really there really wasn't a strong evidence base for that primary prevention approach, which is what we you know you've been talking about, we've been talking about, which is you know slowly becoming more the norm. But we knew that we needed more than one one way of attacking it and we needed to to build the evidence as to what's going to work so so there, there's three main prongs of work well there's the work well toolkit which is an online repository of resources and and giving people you know step-by-step actions as to you know how to assess risk and then what to do about it um, and that that in itself is then tailored further. It's tailored for size of business and tailored for, for industry sector. So, so it's sort of that multi-pronged approach there. But then the, the two major funding programs, the Mental Health Improvement Fund, which you're, you're part of, um, which is using this partnership approach to um, um, focused in different sectors um, to actually trial different interventions to say, What's going to work in education versus what's going to work in health, um, and how do we how do we actually uh, and, and you know assess those to to understand what's going to make a difference, and then the third one is the work well learning networks, and and they're more like a community of practice. They're pulling workplaces together to. I mean, we use the words like collaboratively problem solve. So it's it's uh, it's it's not work safe coming in with this is how you must do things. It's saying we need to build this together to work, work out how it's going to work. And so that's the multi-pronged approach. It's really just different interventions for different sectors, for different size um, industry, um, so that people can pick and choose a bit what's going to work for them. Yeah, and it was a significant investment, right? It was at fifty million dollars for the 50, program. Yeah, fifty million dollars. So it is a huge investment. So, and it's got a really big evaluation component to it. Mm. We've got um, uh, we we've got uh, an expert reference group. We call them, but it's uh, five, uh, five academics of the lead academics from three different universities. So, from Monash University, University of Melbourne, and University of South Australia. Um, as well as our own internal evaluation team. So, uh, so it's got this very strong, um, uh, we, we're here to, to learn. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, we don't very often, you know, in my long career, you don't very often have an opportunity to, to have such a lengthy program um, that is multi-pronged, that has got so many different interventions and a really big evaluation over the top. So, so we're building the evidence, you know, at a population level rather than, or including at workplace by workplace level, but, but really building the evidence as to, to how, how we can influence and how we can actually make change. Yeah, and we're going to talk about psychosocial safety climate later when we start um, talking about some of the uh, the key learnings that have come out of the program to date. But if you do talk to Maureen Dollard, she's probably the one person that we missed this year. Oh, did um, you? In our first year, we have not been able to secure her on the show. We've been able to get the likes of Tony LaMontagna and the great Ange Martin on the show, but Maureen Dollard is the one that got away this year. So uh, if you run uh, into next her... Year. Oh, yeah, well, look, yes. Um, so Nick Crooks, who's our um, senior evaluation officer, talks to Maureen all the time. So, yeah. uh, yes, but look, she is a busy lady. But, you know, gosh, she's been very influential in, mm. in our thinking and obviously one of the authors on our Emerging Outcomes report. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, we'll, so, prod her. we'll prod her, Jason. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jen. <laughs> we keep seeding that, don't we, with yeah, yeah, different yeah. guests? She's getting a lot of prods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, Jen, you spoke briefly about the importance of taking a prevention-focused approach. Um, can you tell us, for our listeners, explain a little bit more about that and particularly within the work well context? Yeah, sure. Look, and I know you guys talk about this all the time, but, you know, I guess we're, we're Victorian. Uh, we, um, our, our work is very much embedded in our, you know, what does our Oc Health and Safety Act say? And it says, you know, employers must provide and maintain a working environment that's safe and without risks to health. And that includes psychological health. And we think, we think that, you know, people overall have a reasonably good understanding of, you know, what it actually means to do a risk assessment approach for physical health, but for psychological health, as you guys know, it's just a bit harder concept. So WorkWell has adopted the, um, the 11 work-related factors that impact mental health as that framework. Um, so it's trying to put some more practical um, language, I guess, around what those psychological risks are. Um, and, and hopefully we're building up some really practical and tangible um, how to assess those work-related factors and how to, to actually control them. And I guess that's what we're asking all of the projects to explore that further. But those 11 work-related factors, I guess we just bang on about them quite a lot. But, you know, they're things that people, you know, if we list them, people always sort of nod and say, yeah, yeah, they make sense. But they're the, they're the things that in workplaces, if they're managed well, you're more likely to have a mentally healthy workplace. If they're not managed well, that's when we can tip people over into being stressed. So the, the, I won't go through all of them, but just a couple of them are, you know, it's high or low job demands. So if people are overworked, that obviously is a, a cause of stress. So, you know, we're talking about the root causes. Or if they're underworked, if people are going to work and not feeling that they've got meaning, not feeling uncomfortable that they've just not got enough to do, that is also can be a cause of stress. Um, Low role clarity. So if people go to work and don't actually know what they're meant to be doing or that there's overlap between different jobs and not clear de delineation of roles, that can be stressful. Um, other things are, you know, poor workplace relationships. And I think we, you know, that's the one that we often, we often see be that, um, um, that people are just not treated respectfully, that, that people are bullied. Um, that there might be um, sexual harassment, those sorts of things. You know, if they're not managed well, if people are not in a respectful environment, that's a work-related risk that um, can lead to stress. The other big ones are, um, you know, occupational violence, trauma. Uh, and obviously in a, a mentally healthy workplace, those things, violence and aggression, uh, as much as possible, eliminated. Just shouldn't happen. Um, but if there is occupational violence or aggression, that there are systems in place to, um, to minimise that and then to respond appropriately to it. So they're sorts of the work-related factors that we talk about. So, and, and a primary prevention approach is around addressing those, working out if what the root causes of stress within the workplace is. And the only way of finding that out is talking with staff. And, but using this framework of the 11 work-related factors provides a, a really good language um, and process to actually work in that primary prevention space. Yeah, so I think um, a, few, a few things resonated there with me. Um, certainly the, you know, you need to consult with your workforce to understand what are the um, what are the psychosocial hazards that are significant for them? Um, you know, because that's really going to vary, um, you know, with individual factors and sort of social climate of the team and, and all of those types of things. Um, so doing a, I guess your typical top down risk assessment isn't, isn't really necessarily going to give you an accurate picture of, um, of what people are exposed to. Um, I think the other good point there that you made is that you know we can do 
all that we can to try to eliminate these hazards. But the reality is that, you know, sometimes they're going to emerge regardless of of what we do. So we still need to maintain um, monitoring and um, and being able to respond and intervene when when they do start to emerge. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's that's the big, you know, this this cultural change that we're trying to embed. It's it isn't just a a one off thing that we say to workplaces. You know, just go in and do a, a tick and flick um, to to assess your psychosocial hazards because it, it we're talking about workplace culture, aren't we? And that's something that you know how we do things around here every day. It's it's not just the the, the one off. Um, so so you're right. It's a um, you can't do these sorts of risk assessments without doing really proper, good consultation with your staff to understand and continually go back because it's it's going to be different. It's going to be different mm-hmm. when you get different people into the group. It's going to be different because of different environmental things, different, you know, business, what, what's happening in business, what's happening with COVID, for goodness sake. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and hopefully some of your controls have been effective and you've got new top risks that you have to deal with. That's right. So, yeah. That's right, yeah. And I think the other thing with the work-related factors is that they they interrelate, don't mm. they? Um, yeah. So um, you often can't just pull one out and say, well, we'll just fix this one. It's because, you know, the uh, um, you know if you've got poor recognition and reward, that probably results in poor workplace relationships and probably... You know that uh, organisational justice is not great either. You know, so they're they they they're usually interrelated. Um, yeah, there's been some good articles out recently talking about bullying and harassment and saying that's often a symptom of you know high job demands and low support, for example. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, dealing with bullying and harassment isn't as simple as bringing in a policy. Uh, it's also looking at your other work-related factors. Yeah, and I think that's it. That for me, it's it's helping workplaces to understand how to unpick the cause of a stress. You know, mm-hmm. so so what is the symptom? And as you said, Jason, is it that um, you know people are not being nice to each other? But why is that? Is that because they are really fatigued? Um, is it because uh, you know roster? You know, a, a roster is just atrocious. Um, you know, is it that the workload is is really high? Uh, you know, what is it? So really unpicking what are what are the root causes of the symptom, um, which might be that that um, people are, are, are being um, disrespectful to each other. Yeah, and as you've alluded to, you can't do that without consultation. <laughs> you can't just do a survey and go, yep, we understand the issue. That's it. Let's um, apply an intervention and we're done. Mm. Um, it's, no, you really need to get to the heart of the matter. Um, one of the stories that still sticks out from a previous guest was from Karen Ma, and she was able to um, track back bullying harassment to dehydration. <laughs> and yeah, once, wow. they, yeah. once they improved hydration, and it actually dramatically reduced the amounts of reports of bullying harassment. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And you know, I was listening to to someone the other day, um, a, a young junior emergency doctor, um, talking about incredibly long shifts and not having time to go to the toilet Mm. or to get a drink of water um so you know you just think well your your psychological resilience is going to reduce um because of your 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 physical discomfort um Mm. so it's absolutely right so it it is absolutely it's unpicking isn't it to work out so so what is the thing that's that's causing um causing this issue Mm. Yeah, a banana's not going to fix it, is it, Joe? No, well, uh, you know. Maybe an apple and a banana. If if the problem is that you haven't got a a break and you need some, you know, you've got a blood sugar concern, then a banana might help. (laughs) True. I'm I'm being glib, listeners. Don't take that seriously. (laughs) Please do not start offering bananas to your employees who are feeling stressed. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, but Jen, um, one of the things we really love um, being a recipient ourselves uh, is the, uh, the work, or oh, sorry, the Mental Health Improvement Fund. Mm-hmm. Um, so I believe there's 25 projects. Yeah, that look, we've funded that. 25, some are finished. And uh, um, the beauty of this is that they, uh, you know, it's big investment and, uh, and they run for 
I think the shortest are 18 months, the longest are three years. So it's, it's a really significant amount of time for, um, for projects to, to do this real digging deep into particular problems in, in, in a sector um, and, and, and working out interventions and then, then sharing those learnings. So it's, uh, um, and again, uh, you know, lots of the projects have tried things and some haven't worked, but we need to know that. Um, because uh, otherwise, as you know, a government funding agency, we don't want to just keep on funding things that um, that are, that don't actually work. We're wanting to, uh, and that's you know, that's where we want this real honesty and transparency around, um, you know, what what works, what doesn't, um, so that we can get best bang for buck, so we get best outcome for workers. Yeah, but Jason, why don't you talk about? Um, talk about your project that you're working with Geelong Grammar in the education sector, because I reckon that that will give a really good, um, uh, you know, a, a real life example of, of what the Mental Health Improvement Fund projects are doing. Yeah, well, it's great to have you on to ask that question, because it's not, not something that we actually talk about on, on our podcast. So um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we identified the Improvement Fund um, as a funding opportunity before, oh, I think, it, it might have been when the money was actually put out there as, hey, this is going to be particularly for this improvement fund. And we figured it would be a good fit for us, given the focus on systemically addressing work-related stress, um, you know, taking a psych health and safety approach, um, essentially. Um, at that point, we had just started building out Flourish DX, our, our product. And um, we thought, well, you know, uh, we know there's going to be three rounds of funding. So let's aim for round three to have our product ready uh, for then, and, and fortunately, we were. We also needed a Victorian lead for our project, and we already had an existing relationship with the guys at Geelong Grammar School, uh, their Institute of Positive Education. You know, they are world leaders in the application of positive psychology within the education context. Um, not risk management professionals or, or psych health and safety professionals. So um, it was great for us to go to them and say, hey, do you realize there's this whole other area, you know, rather than just focusing on giving people skills to flourish, we can also look at, you know, contextual work-related factors um, that we can also address using a, a risk lens uh, in order to improve the conditions so that people have that opportunity to flourish as well, not just put it on individual behaviors. Uh, and they really like that. And um, you know, there's a really good um opportunity for us to collaborate on the project. Um, so we providing the subject matter expertise from our end and the the tool in Flourish DX and them doing the on the ground implementation. And then we had some researchers from Monash University to conduct an independent evaluation. Now, Jen, I still reckon we're probably the most rigorous in terms of evaluation. We actually with Monash set it up as a randomized control trial yeah, and registered it as a and registered clinical trial as well. Um, I think, yeah, with the impacts of COVID though, we're going to struggle to have you know, enough good data and we might, it might end up being the qualitative data that ends up being the, the more valuable part of the, the data that we collect as part of the evaluation. But, you know, some of the learnings that we've gotten already are, you know, while schools are um, really invested in, you know, teacher wellbeing, um, you know, psych health and safety is new to them. So there does need to be a bit of training up front. We definitely did provide that to, you know, leadership teams and to, you know, wellbeing committees as, as part of the, the implementation. Um, Going from collecting the data around the risks to developing action plans has been the, the stickiest bit or the hardest bit to accomplish. I mean, it was always in our intention to have an action planning tool um, that would guide um, companies and, and leaders through the development of action plans to address identified risks um, through our tools. Um, and that's just kind of cemented in our mind that we really need to fast track those features mm -hmm. in order to, to bridge that gap between understanding what the main hazards are to what are, what's actually a feasible um, intervention to address the, mm -hmm. these identified hazards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if the goal is to make companies as self-sustainable as possible and not beholden to consultants, um, then, you know, we, we just need to have those tools built in sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, overall, it's been, um, you know, quite fascinating to work with, I think, about 30 schools um, as part of our project. Um, and uh, yeah, Geelong's done a great job in doing all the, uh, the hard, you know, handholding, pushing you know, schools through during COVID and all the lockdowns that have been in Victoria, pushing them through the different elements of, of the implementation. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really hopeful that a lot of these schools have set up processes now that they can do as, as a cycle of continuous improvement now. Uh, versus feeling like they've just done a one-off activity. 
So, um, but it's, um, yeah, it's been great for us as a learning and hopefully the schools are getting a lot of value out of it as well. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I'm sure, you know, there'll be broader learnings to, to other educational um, parts, you know, in Victoria, but hopefully beyond. Jason, do you reckon there's an aha moment? You know, I think that we have the, um, when we, and you guys as projects seem to know this better than us, but going into workplaces and talking about um, trying to put a risk-based approach on psych health. When do you, when do you get that aha moment that workplace mental health is, is more than supporting people from when they're distressed? Is there something that you just feel like when you say it or, or there's a different point that people actually really get it? It's funny, right? Because um, WorkSafe Victoria have got some great publications out there, um, uh, even specifically aimed at schools and talking about the main occupational health and safety risks. Um, and in schools, it's manual handling and psychosocial risks. Um, yet these things are not widely understood or accepted by schools. And often it's in the initial part of our work as part of this project where we're giving a presentation. Well, this is where Geelong Grammar do, that, do their bit, but it's that presentation to the leadership team and talking about you know, how they manage physical health risks and then equating that to, to psychological risks. And they very quickly see how deficient mm -hmm. uh, they are. I mean, if you look at um, knowing that psychosocial um, hazard exposure is one of the biggest risks to school teachers, um, if you think about their, their roles, you know, it's, um, you know, uh, lots of hours, lots of contact time, you know, managing 20 to 30 students in a classroom, managing uh, increasing t uh, parent expectations on, you know, con being contactable and, you know, all the rest, uh, the bureaucracy in schools, the, uh, the requirement to, you know, even work during breaks because you have to supervise kids every now and again in recess and lunch breaks. It's, it's, it's actually quite a demanding job. Mm. It doesn't matter how much time they get off, like, um, they actually they actually need that to plan for the following year. It's not all holidays as uh, as you quickly find. But anyway, um, it's that if you look at risk registers, and I've had the benefit of being on a school board myself um, and seeing the risk register. You know, they have all of the physical health risks covered under the sun. You know, working at height, working mm. in confined spaces, electrical hazards, um, but very seldomly do they actually uh, acknowledge the exposure to psych hazards in their risk register, which would be the number one thing mm. for school teachers you'd think so um you know when we did that as part of the um the implementation actually doing a review of both their health and safety policy as well as their risk register and um you know when you start pointing out well you've got all of these things here have you thought about work-related stress in the same way you know that's probably where you get that first aha moment yeah um but then school teachers i think have been uh, really accepting of it as well and um really buying into it going well uh, if you just give us a, a, a mindfulness app or tell us to go for a walk to manage, you know, these ridiculous amounts of, you know, demands that you're putting on us, that's not going to cut it. You know, we need to, you know, you actually have a responsibility as well. So it's um, the teachers, I think, really have been uh, appreciating that their employer is taking actions to address things that are within their control rather than just pushing it down to an individual level responsibility. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's been learnings from both the leadership teams because, you know, we're talking about largely educators, um, not health and safety professionals. Um, so it's a lot of learning from them. But then the school teachers, you know, getting that benefit of going, well, no, it's not just about me being more resilient or not being able to, you know, hack it. You know, our employer does actually have an obligation to make sure that, you know, what we're being asked to do is reasonable. Mm. And I think um, in this space, it's, it's providing um, a language to to workers and a common language to workers and managers um, around, you know, what do we actually mean by a psychosocial risk or a, um, uh, a psychological hazard? You know, we use lots of words that are not necessarily um, in common usage uh, and sometimes, you know, getting it back down to, well, the work-related factors that impact mental health, maybe that just resonates a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why part of our intervention is um, an education piece. So yeah. even before getting the teachers involved in um, a risk assessment, it's like, well, let's get them well versed in what are the key work related mm. factors as you identified the, you know, the, the 11 from um, mm. you know, WorkSafe. Mm. Um, 
and, and make sure that they're aware of that. And then when they're presented with questions around these factors, they're like, oh, okay, that's why they're asking me about that because it is a, you know, a, a work-related stressor. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. So, Jen, can you tell us about the Emerging Outcomes Report then? Yeah, look, sure, Jason. It's it's one of the beauties of having a, a large population-based program that we can we can get statewide data that really does help us to, to learn what's working and what isn't. Um, so we've released our halfway emerging outcomes report um, and with the academics I mentioned before, um, we've developed a, a predictive model, um, which we're, we're hoping we'll build on. You know, it's, it's quite formative at the moment, but it just is giving us um, a bit more confidence uh, when we're giving advice to workplaces. And that predictive model is, um, is saying, well, if workplaces have pretty general OHS policies, practices, systems in place, so those risk management systems, those reporting systems, um, complaint sort of systems, those, those systems that we know from OHS, they have those, as well as having leaders who, who care, to be frank. So leaders who actually care about um, about their, their staff and, um, and, and will respond to occupational stress and say, we'll do something about it and, and, and workers see that. So if you've got those two things in place, so those the OHS systems and leaders who are committed to reducing occupational stress, actually seeing better, and the measure is quality of work life. Um, so better quality of work life outcomes for both workers and managers. Um, so in real, what that actually means is good systems, good OHS systems, leaders who care means that workers and managers are, are reporting better general well-being and mental health, which is great because it kind of just gives this, um, you know, step-by-step -step approach about what actually works. The next part of that predictive model is then the return on investment part of it. And, and what the, the emerging um, research is telling us that um, for those workplaces with that better um, psychosocial climate, um, that they've got less presenteeism and less absenteeism. So it means that people are at work, if they're at work, they're actually working uh, and they are at work, um, which obviously has a bottom line dollar um, result. So, so this is what our academics are actually going to be starting publishing really soon, which is, which is quite exciting. Um, and we'll be still be getting more data through from all of the, um, the workplaces that are involved through the Mental Health Improvement Fund, such as yours, Jason, and Learning Networks, um, and, uh, and as well as toolkit users. So, um, so it's, it's really quite exciting. Mm. Yeah, um, I love it how, you know, th there are people out there um, who go, yep, we just need to improve psychosocial safety climate and then we're going to get all these great benefits. Mm -hmm. Like, well, psychosocial safety climate is more of an outcome of, like you say, leaders who are showing care and trust uh, and having a health and safety system that incorporates psycho psychosocial <laughs> risk management. Um, and so th those are two big pieces um, that you need to get right in order to improve psychosocial safety climate and then um, get all those benefits that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um we, we did talk about uh, care and trust. I think that was actually one of the titles of one of our previous podcasts with, with Clive, Clive Lloyd. Yeah. And in fact, that would have just replayed before this episode over Christmas. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, that was a really good one. And um, yeah, we, we talk commonly about, you know, what is the risk management approach um, uh, applied to psychosocial hazards. So um, uh, it's uh, yeah good to hear from you, the importance of that and some of the benefits that companies can get that you guys are starting to put quantitative data behind and, and using that as a predictive um, uh, measure. Mm, it is, it is. You know, because I think most of us working in this area would say, well, we kind of knew that. Um, but, you know, actually having fairly big po population data to, to reinforce that and then build that into a, a model, a predictive model, um, you know, that's, that's, that's new and it's, it's pretty exciting. Mm. Mm, terrific. So um, a little while ago, we released a um, what we an anecdotal model of um, maturity, mental health maturity in organisations. I guess sort of a readiness for different types of mental health interventions. Um, and understand that um, 
your organization has done something similar? Yeah, so so much, absolutely. So kind of, what we've done is overlaid that um, that predictive model against a, a theoretical, probably the similar one to what you use, cultural maturity model. And what we mean by that is that, you know, down the bottom of the, the um, trajectory is a, a workplaces that uh, probably aren't going to do anything, um, you know, probably have very low awareness of their responsibilities. Um, so that right down the bottom, the next step up would be those workplaces that will react if um, um, something happens within their workplace, for example, there's a bullying issue, they'll react. And then the third level is what we're calling is, is systematic. Um, and, and when we overlay the, the predictive model on that, we find that that's the tipping point. Um, so if, if, if workplaces are in that systematic sort of that they've got systems in place, that is the tipping point to tip over into, into that um, um, higher psychosocial um, safety climate. Um, so it really, and, and then the, the next two levels up, you know, we get right to generative and they're obviously those workplaces who, um, who do continual improvement, who will do all their, their great consultation with their employees, that they'll constantly review their risks and constantly make changes based on, on how, they, how they're improving. Um, but having that model enables us, I guess, in this big program design sort of state to say, well, we do need different interventions for the people, those workplaces down the bottom. And I guess for us being part of a regulator, um, you know, there's probably some workplaces that will only respond to the stick. Um, and so, so having um, moving into to a new phase where we're going to have psychosocial regulations in Victoria mid next year, I guess that's, you know, one way to address those lower cultural maturity workplaces, um, whereas we can sort of work on the aspirational ones through some of the, the, the work well sorts of interventions. So it's a bit, you know, that, you know, um, appropriate interventions at, pe at workplaces, different levels of, um, of maturity. Mm. Yeah, um, and it's so important to target your intervention at the right level. Um, and I think, you know, speaking as somebody who has worked internally to organisations previously, um, it can be frustrating at times when you can see, you know, where you want to be um, and you want to be, you know, doing your intervention up there where you want to be, but you really just have to actually take a step back and say, well, no, what's actually going to be successful for this organisation in its context at this point in time? Let's start there and let's work towards that that aspiration um, over time. And just I think it, it really requires a a hefty dose of pragmatism. Absolutely. Um, and Jason, I'm not sure if you were in a network meeting that we had last week with um, all of our fund recipients and, uh, and there were some, some sectors particularly who um, were saying, look, we're really still at that awareness education level. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that we've got, you know, appropriate intervention, appropriate um, information um, for, for those workplaces that are just not ready for this systemic approach as yet. Um, but I guess the other good thing out of our research is that um, between um, the, the baseline data collection and then the follow-up data collection, which I think was about two years, there was actually a shift in um, employers' um, self-assessed confidence in, um, in assessing psychosocial risk and doing something about it at all levels. So even the ones who are really low in the baseline moved up, I think it was about five percentage points. So, so there was a move at sort of every level. So, so you know, you just got to say that's a win because we're not going to get everyone to be, I think generative is the, our cultural maturity high level. Um, not everyone's going to get there. Mm. Yeah, and I think that would be a key learning from our funded program as well um, in schools mm. in that, you know, we really um, wanted to use the time that we had with schools to get them to take that systemic approach and incorporate it into policy and into the risk register and um, to do continuous improvement. But 
Um, some schools just clearly weren't ready for that, but we were forced because of COVID um, to really shorten, I guess, the amount of time um, of our intervention from, you know, we wanted 12 months and it ended up being about six months that we could spend. Some of them are spending a bit longer and um, the team over at the Institute of Positive Education have been quite good in giving some additional consulting time with those schools. So it's taken a bit longer to go through the process. Um, but we really see the tipping point is um, – uh, in our maturity um, model is where a school or a workplace starts to understand mental health isn't something that people just bring to work. Mm. Work can also impact on on mental health. Mm. So let's start talking about these work-related factors and start thinking about how we can work together. So more of a shared responsibility uh, for mental health outcomes rather than just putting it down onto, you know, overworked individuals. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. So, um, Jen, fascinating um, the work that uh, you're being able to do at such a large scale um, through WorkSafe and, and the Work World Program. And it's been great hearing you talk all about, you know, some of the, the outcomes that have come out of this and the, and the key learnings. Um, looking into the future now, uh, what would your hopes be for mental health in the workplace? Oh, Jason, I think you, you just articulated that really beautifully. I think it's um, our hopes are that, that when people think about workplace mental health, that they actually think about the root causes of poor mental health. So think about um, managing mental health in the workplace the same way they manage workplace mental health. Um, so using that risk management approach uh, where, where people you know, really understand that the work-related factors all need to be on the positive to have a mentally healthy workplace. So I guess that's my hope that uh, that when someone talks about workplace mental health, they don't immediately think of EAP programs or, um, uh, or resilience training or, um, you know, are you okay days? All of those things are fantastic and they are needed, but they put into their bucket of a program, a workplace mental health program that actually has this risk management approach. Um, and I think it's that thing that, um, uh, you know, my hope is that that the workplaces, you know, get to that point where uh, where people are as important as productivity, um, and our you know, and we know that our building evidence base is that you know, good mental health in workplaces is good for business, and and that that just becomes an accepted thing. Yeah, terrific. And do you have some words of advice for listeners um, who are thinking about maybe working in the field of psych health and safety? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a, a huge emerge, it's emerging. It's been around for, for years. But, you know, there, there's I think there's greater investment there. I think absolutely if you're thinking about working in this field, really understand um, the, the primary prevention approach. Um, I think really understand the integrated approach that Tony Lamatania would have spoken about um, and, and be prepared if you are going as a consultant into workplaces that, that you will be entering workplaces at different levels of that cultural maturity model, um, which means, as Joelle said, that you might need to change your pitch to start working at that awareness level, but make sure you keep your eye on the main game of getting to having a systemic approach um, and not just going in with the band-aids. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's also, if you, you're going to be working in this area, understand what we mean by a systemic approach. You know, it is those policies and practices. It is the risk management approach. Um, it, is, it is also supporting leaders to have the right settings as well. And some of that's not easy, um, but I guess that's, you know, that's that's the real exciting challenge of, of this work. Um, and uh, and look, I just do hope that we, we do get more um, people who, who have this approach. And so the investment um, across the country is more in this primary prevention space rather than, than, than always doing the, the secondary and tertiary interventions. Some very practical words of advice there, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, Jen, it's been fantastic having you on. Um, it's been uh, def- definitely we've wanted to have someone from uh, WorkSafe Victoria on and great to have someone talk about the WorkWell program, um, given the scale that you're working at there and, um, and, and the amount of impact that you're having. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, listeners, well, that that brings us to the end of another excellent episode. Um, Remember, we do video these uh, when we're doing Zoom. So you can jump on to uh, the YouTube, Flourish GX YouTube channel and check out the video. We'll also be pulling out some of the best clips out of this and there'll be a few uh, and we'll be putting them on the Flourish GX LinkedIn page if you want to follow along there. Um, Joelle and I are very active on LinkedIn. um, So feel free to to reach out and uh, connect with us too if you'd like to continue the conversation there. But that's it for today. We will catch you next episode. It's still there.